You live in illusion and the appearance of things. There is a reality, but you do not know this. When you understand this, you will see that you are nothing. And being nothing, you are everything. That is all. discuss Zen Buddhism and incorporating mindfulness into daily life. My name is Matthew Hawk Mahoney, and in today's episode, we will be discussing Zazen and Zen practice with Jayozen Anju. Jayozen Anju is the abbot of Kanzienji, a Zen temple in Southern California. All right. Hey, Jayozen. Hello. How are you, Matthew? Doing well, doing well. Thank you for meeting with me. And this is actually, we had talked for about five minutes while we were getting set up here. But this is our first time actually ever communicating. Yes. So chat. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. Through 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 chat. Um I actually met you on Insight Timer. That's right. The, yeah, the meditation app. That's been a really great tool. So it's a good way to connect. Anyways, thank you for meeting with me. This is my first official interview I've actually ever done. Wow. <laughs> I'm honored. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure I've done, not exactly like this. I mean, in person, we, we have interviews and question and answer talks, but I don't think I've ever done one on, online. Yeah, it's uh, it's kind of a new format. I apologize to the listeners out there if we run into some bumps. First time. And are you okay with swear words, or how do you feel about if swear words come into the conversation? I don't use them, but you're welcome to do okay. whatever you feel comfortable so have you have you listened to uh, Brene Brown? She has a new podcast, and it looks like our video connection might be a little bit messed up. Yes, I, I, I lost you on there, but as long as the sound is good, we should be fine. Yeah. But anyways, she has a, a new podcast she came out with, and she was talking about the first time she did this podcast, and she said she has a new saying for something anytime she does something new, and she's a, you know, abbreviated FFT. And what that means is fucking first time. <laughs> <laughs> you know? yeah, we usually just say tech. <laughs> yeah. Technology. Oh, what's that mean? I have Oh, technology. Right. So anytime something goes wrong, because we use zoom and everything now, right? Mm-hmm. So every time something goes wrong, we just go technology. It's our new practice. We have what we call a right. continuous practice in Zen. And so our new mm-hmm. continuous practice is just dealing with technology. Yeah, yeah, it is. And we actually, I do have some questions later on that'll kind of lead into that. That'll be interesting to hear your thoughts on. But for the sake of myself and the listeners, I would like to kind of get to know you a little bit more before we jump into some of the Zen questions. And yeah, so would you kind of, and this can be awkward, I think, for some people, because it's, you know, introduce yourself. But yeah, if you'd like to kind of introduce yourself, you know, who you are, where you live, what you do kind of thing? Sure. Happy to do it. Yeah, everybody needs to know who it is they're listening to. So I, yeah. as you can see, I'm using my Dharma name or my Buddhist name, Jozen, which my teacher mm-hmm. kind of insisted on using around the temples. Uh, some yeah. temples like it, some temples don't. We we use ours. Uh, mm-hmm. If you saw me on Insight Timer or Facebook, you'll see I even use my Anju. Anju is actually a title. So that's very unusual to use your title. But I use it because it's how some people know me. My teacher calls me Anju San, for instance, or did for a think Abbot. So Anju is just somebody who lives in a small temple. So I lived in a small temple, so he called me Anju San as soon as he made it a small temple. Yeah. Uh, and so then everybody knew me as Anju San. So if I didn't have the Anju in my name, nobody would know how to find me. So oh, usually you'll find oh. me as Jozen Anju. It's, okay. it's almost egotistical to use it because suddenly you're using your title <laughs> and your name. Uh, but I'm, I'm a little egotistical, so it, it's okay, I suppose. Yeah. It matches who I right. am. <laughs> it's, it's considered a no-no in Japan. Oh, so, so I didn't know that. So Anju, Anju's son, is, it, you said it has to be with a practitioner at a small temple? Is that what you're right. saying? Right. Usually it's the person who okay. lives there, and he usually lives there by themselves. And An is usually like a little hut, a little hermitage, if you will. Mm. And so when okay. I used to practice with my teacher from his temple, which was also just his house, 
I had a little mm -hmm. shed in the back that I converted into a little zendo for me to meditate in. Oh, wow. And so I would meditate in there. And I was with him for about 12 years at this point. And some of my mm -hmm. kudo Japanese archery students wanted to sit meditation with me in there. And yeah. I wasn't really comfortable, even though I was already a Zen monk, I guess you could say, monastic, mm -hmm. but I think we call ourselves monks, or the Zen monk. Uh, so he said, yes, you can teach them. You can put them in your Zendo with you. That's great. And I'm like, no, no, I'm not comfortable with that. I haven't, I've been <laughs> teaching the Japanese archery, but I haven't been teaching Zen to anybody. I'm not really comfortable with that. Yeah. And he said, oh, you should do it. And I'm like, well, I'll tell you what, if you'll come in, I used to travel with him to people's homes and we would do mm -hmm. these blessing ceremonies. Yeah. We would use water and fire and earth and the elements and we would bless their homes. And I said, if you would come mm -hmm. and do one of those blessing ceremonies at the temple, at my little zendo, uh, then I would be comfortable. I would I'd feel like I have your blessing. Mm -hmm. He said, absolutely, we'll do it. So usually in, with those instances, I went and I picked him up. He, he, he could drive, but he liked it in those instances if somebody drove him. So I went and I mm -hmm. picked him up and I brought him to my home and my little zendo and my students came, a dozen of us or so. Mm -hmm. And he performed the most elaborate blessing ceremony I had ever been with him. It was just so beautiful. Mm -hmm. And so on the drive home, I said, I told him that. That's the most beautiful blessing ceremony I've ever been with you. And I've been with you in many blessing ceremonies. And he's like, oh, that wasn't a blessing ceremony. That's a temple dedication ceremony. Your home is now a temple. And that little zendo is your temple. And what did you call it? You called it Jizo An. So An is the little An for Anju. So mm -hmm. he says, that's Jizo An. You're the Anju. From Jizo An. So from that day until I became abbot at Kanzio Ji, he called me Anju San. Ah, uh, okay. Now it's clicking. See, and I didn't even catch on to that on Insight Timer. I know maybe I noticed that extra those extra characters, but I didn't realize that that's what it meant. Right. Um, that's why I explained it. That's really cool. So you so it kind of started out. You'd been practicing for eleven. You said eleven years, and at that teaching... point, yeah. So actually, to me. My formal practice started in 1966 with the martial arts. That's when somebody actually taught me how to meditate. And that's that was kind of the next question was like, how did yeah, how did you get started in Zen Buddhism and meditation? Right. So meditation in general was in martial arts, what we call Mei Salt, which is a kind of uh, Mei is your eyes. E is it's a multi-layered, but kind of the elements. And mm -hmm. soul is your mind. Mm -hmm. So, I don't know how what that means, <laughs> but usually yeah. we translate it as meditation. So, basic Japanese meditation is called Mei So. And so, they, mm -hmm. called, they taught us Mei So, and some teachers later taught us uh, Mokusho. Mu is the mm -hmm. void, right? So, it's to empty your, your mind. Mm -hmm. Mokusho. Yeah. So, that kind of meditation. So, I did those. But before that, I, and I think lots of people probably experience this as a kid when you're just sitting under a tree and you, you, all you hear is the birds or you hear your heartbeat or mm -hmm. you don't think anything at all. You're just kind of veggie. It's not wandering mind. It's, not, it's like a no mind, right? You're just there mm -hmm. experiencing the world. And so to me, that was my first meditation experience. I just didn't know what mm -hmm. it was. You know, just sitting there, right? And of course, there's wandering mind meditations too. That's not really a meditation if your mind is wandering too much, but there is such a thing. But as a kid, so that's the way I felt I started. Uh, and then the martial arts, and then it was my last, my current martial arts teacher who really clicked them together. He's a Shingon Buddhist priest. Shingon means true sound, different sect, not a Zen sect. And he, because of the Buddhism, and he, even though he's teaching this martial arts, Buddhism infiltrates it. Mm -hmm. And so I consider him my root Buddhist teacher. Mm, okay. He's a Buddhist priest teaching us. So we meditated every day. We chanted the Heart Sutra every day. Uh, mm -hmm. I was very, very close to him, becoming like the top student that he did. Uh, oh, wow. We were roommates for a while. It, it really clicked. We really clicked. And mm -hmm. so I, I learned a lot from that. And then he got married and moved away. And I got married and moved away. And he wasn't really far. And I said, I need to meditate every day. And I'm not with you every day anymore. So I'll come down to your house and we'll meditate every day. And he's like, you know, that's an hour drive. You, you shouldn't do that every day. You should find a little temple or somebody by your house and you should meditate every day. And so 
I started looking and I couldn't really find anything that clicked with me. And then one day at a bookstore, I saw a list of Buddhist temples. And I opened it up and I opened it to the page with this one right by my house. I didn't even know it was there because it's this fellow's house. Huh. And I'm like, that's fantastic. That's where I'll go. And I called and he said, don't come. We're moving up into the mountains, building a whole new temple up there. So don't even bother to come. We're closing soon. And I'm like, oh, so my whole inspiration is destroyed. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't know what to do. So I just meditated on my own every day here. Mm -hmm. And then my daughter, she was doing yoga around the house. But she's mm -hmm. three years old, so big. <laughs> and she, she's just doing yoga everywhere. And I said, we need to find her a yoga class. And we're at Jamba yeah. Juice. And at Jamba Juice, there's a sign up, kids yoga. That's perfect. I'll call them. We'll go. And I called. And we went. And we're there. And this guy walks in and he talks. And I'm like, I know that voice. They said, didn't I talk to you about coming to, for Zen? Is this the same place? And he's like, yes, yes, yes. I thought you were moving <laughs> to the mountains. He said, oh, the students really asked if we would stay. Uh -oh. And so I stayed. And he said, why don't you come do Zen? And I'm like, okay, I'll come. I want to do Zen every day, but I wanted to do it with a Sangha. And mm -hmm. so I, I started going there every day. And for years, I went there every day. What, what do you think was... What was the, where did that internal drive come from to practice Zazen? I think it comes from the practice itself. Right. If you do the practice, the practice embeds itself in you. And then you have, I, I feel like I have no choice. I have to sit every day, whether it's with the Sangha or by myself. Uh, we have Zoom now. And I don't go every day to the Zoom. I have other people run it. But I go almost every day there. But if I'm not there, I find myself sitting <laughs> wherever I am. Oh, it's 7 p.m. Yeah. I'll have to sit and wherever I am, a bus or <laughs> a car, I pull over to the side and I sit. Oh, it's 7 p.m. I have to sit now. <laughs> so I, I, I think it just, it just does that to you. I, I agree with that. That's kind of the experience I've had. I mean, at first, for me, sitting... A lot of people experience that uncomfortable feeling, that uncomfortable, you know, the whatever it's their you know, their back or their legs or whatever. That's kind of normal. But for me, yeah, it was definitely very early on that I experienced, you know, that pull. And it's like, oh yeah, this is a good thing. This is something that I that I should be doing. And um, but you know what's interesting is I go through different phases where, and this is kind of, I know, like that polarized mind. That having you know this is good or this is bad type of thinking, but I sometimes experience with my ideas about zazen. It's either this is amazing, this is great, this is changing my life, and and everything's getting better. And then I have also like, oh my gosh, is this ruining my life? <laughs> We're taking up your whole life, <laughs> right? Shouldn't I actually be out doing something? Yeah, and I think that sometimes I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, for me, I think it's kind of like. A chicken or the egg type of situation uh you know it's been i think the last two weeks it's been a lot of emotion moving through me and sometimes i go through um oh wait am i experiencing this emotion because i'm doing zazen is it causing it or am i is this something i'm working through because of zazen <laughs> you know it's yes and i you know, get caught up thinking like that so it's interesting okay so you kind of I'm going to loosely, you know, kind of follow some of these questions because I feel like the good thing about just the way we're talking is that we're able to kind of cover this stuff naturally. Yes. Nice um, conversation. Yeah. Um, so just to get a general idea, it sounds like I'm kind of getting a general idea of how long you've been practicing Zazen. How long have you been, would you say you've been practicing? Well, again, I go back to my childhood, but my formal Zen yeah. training started in 2000. So. Years, years. 20 years, mm -hmm. right? 20 years. So 20 years is when I met my current Zen teacher. Oh, wow. And you said he's retired now? He actually yeah. made his way to the mountains? As he, he, he didn't make his way to the mountains all by himself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, at yes. least it worked out for him. Yes. That was kind of a funny story too, though. Do you want to hear that? Yeah. So I, I'm, I'm kind of the the... I mean, there's people who've been there longer than me, but I was really following him closely. I, I, I just do what my teachers tell me. So I was really just following him. Mm -hmm. And in 2014, 
no, 2015, he says to me, I'm probably going to retire in a few years. What do you want to do? And mm -hmm. in my mind, I'm like, why are you asking me? All these other people. <laughs> yeah. Right. And mm -hmm. I re of course, I recognized what he wanted. And I said, well, uh, I'll do whatever you tell me to do. And he says, well, what do you need from me? And I said, well, I'm going to need the altar probably if you're going to leave it behind. And so you, you, you saw the video for a little while, the altars there mm -hmm. behind me that he gave me. And so he said, I'll start training you. And I said, that's great. And then about a few months later, just to insert something, a yoga student started. He had yoga. And, and, so the, and, and she started, and that's fine. And he told her, don't come because I'm retiring. Oh, man. But he didn't, and he told her soon. But he had told me a oh. year or two. But in October of that year, he says, okay, I'm retired. <laughs> I'm like, what? What happened to this Whoa. years of training? <laughs> Oh, geez. And so suddenly I found myself as abbot of a small little temple. Yeah. Would you say that, was that, you know, a teacher acting in mysterious ways or was it like, oh, I changed my mind. I'm ready to go now. I don't think they do it on purpose. Yeah. I think that they're just in tune with things. And so mm -hmm. they just, they just go with it. And because they do this all the time. And I don't think they think it out ahead. Okay. I'm going to do it just a little early, and that's really going to throw them for a loop, and then they're going to have to really step up mm -hmm. and learn some stuff fast. You know, um, they're not listening to me if I make it, so they have to listen to me now. They listen to me now. I don't know. I don't. I don't think they do it on purpose. I think that they're just following the way of things, and so I've tried to do the yeah. same thing where I'm not deciding for myself how the temple should evolve. Mm -hmm. I'm just following the principles exactly like the teachers gave it to me, yeah. and then seeing what the Sangha does. Relaxing, kind of relaxing into that form that's been set for you. Right. So I, I, know, I won't let the principles change, but I let the Sangha decide how we're going to manifest them. Mm -hmm. And so it, it allows for a natural evolution. I actually resist the change, just as I resisted us mm -hmm. going to Zoom. And I resisted writing a book. And I resisted all the things my teacher said we don't do. <laughs> I just agreed to ordain somebody that I haven't met in person. It's, oh, wow. It's a, it's a very basic ordination. It's just uh, what we call Yumon Tokudo, which is just uh, uh, recognizing this official Buddhist, right? And yeah, and it seems like there's a big need for that. You know, I live, I, I grew up in Oregon. I lived in Portland, Oregon. And I practiced at a, a temple called Dharma Rain. Yeah, it's in the yeah. Soto Zen tradition. Yes. And, um, and then I moved to uh, Florida and actually didn't really look much at what was available for Sangha out here and not much <laughs> where I'm at at least. And so going back to what you're talking about with the online, you know, meeting people where they're at, I mean, online, it can be a huge, beautiful, beneficial thing, but I'm sure there's uh, going to be some things that are discovered as more people are doing it. It can be, it could be tough because you're not around these people that you're ordaining. You may not be seeing everything. Yeah, so I'll have to be a little more cautious, I guess. But the same thing can happen in person. You don't see everything. You don't live with them. Yeah. So I live with my teachers, but usually you don't. <laughs> so I, I'd like to ask their wives sometimes. So are they really as good as I? <laughs> I don't want to put the wives or, or them on the spot, but I, I feel like that. So I have, I have a question that I want to ask. This is still kind of part of the getting to know you portion of you know, what I've written up here, but I wanted to ask, what's the greatest obstacle you've, you've encountered in your Zazen practice? Wow. I don't know. I'm kind of a natural meditator because I'm not too smart. I think it's harder for the smart people. <laughs> you know, my, my brain doesn't really work unless I give it a kick, you know, a little swift kick. Okay. <laughs> I have to kickstart mine. So uh, it's not so hard for me, but every once in a while I get kind of that monkey mind or my mind is wandering. Wandering mind is probably my biggest obstacle where it's not really a thought I'm aware of. Mm -hmm. So I think I'm meditating, but actually my mind is just kind of floating through different thoughts and ideas. Mm -hmm. 
I'm not really paying attention to them, but they're still there. Mm -hmm. and, and so I have that a lot. It's not stuff that jumps up, but it's this floating kind of mind where I think I'm, I'm there. And it's not true. <laughs> Oh, I see. So you, you kind of catch yourself as you're sitting on the mat. You're, you're like, wait a minute, where was I the last, you know, 15 minutes? Is that kind of what you're well, saying? Not exactly. But it, it, yeah. You just kind of suddenly recognize all the stuff that's been going on. Where you have the other kind of even samadhi where you're, you're so deep, nothing is happening. I mean, the whole time. Mm-hmm. Okay, so some of these questions, now that we're talking, I think maybe need to be a little bit reworked because what it sounds like is from a young age, you've kind of had a very natural connection with and flow with meditation or zazen. Is that That's correct? Right. Yeah, so it makes me a, a horrible teacher because I don't yeah. always understand all the problems that come up. What did you do when this came up? It's like, well, I, I didn't really have that problem <laughs> right but the teaching says you know like i always just go i know the teachings right my teachers gave me right. the teachings and i've heard them talk to other people so i said but the teaching says and i just regurgitate right mm -hmm. that's really that's unique it's special and it's interesting because that's seems like maybe um the opposite of what a lot of people experience what um so then i'm going to edit this question because the original question was what was your biggest misconception about meditation or zazen as a beginner but maybe i could flip that and say what do you th see being one of the biggest misconceptions people bring to zazen what they expect out of the practice mm. i think most people expect to hit some sort of samadhi of blankness mm -hmm. like they're, they're totally oblivious to everything but in zazen we experience everything mm -hmm. There are samadhi meditations where you are oblivious. You know? mm -hmm. I've experienced them, but we don't actually even promote them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right? It's like, no, yeah. no, no. You, yeah, that, that's, that's great, but it's, it's not what we're looking for at all. Right? We're, look, we're looking for uh, experiencing everything exactly as it is. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's zazen. That, that's zenna. Zenna is living in reality exactly as it is you're, you're 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 absorbed into it there's no separation between you and reality mm -hmm. so it could be a good or a bad experience we don't even it's it's irrelevant mm -hmm. just this it, it's just this experience right so that makes that it's a particular kind of way of being it's not even really a meditation right right the others are all kinds of meditations mm -hmm. and I, I i know there's thousands of them I, i've learned hundreds of them in Shingon, we're supposed to memorize the first 1600, right? Which is 1664 mm -hmm. plus two. So <laughs> mm -hmm. there's thousands of them. And, but Zazen is not a technique. It's a way of sitting there, right? And then Dogen, you're from Sotoshu. So Dogen really liked to carry this. He would use the same word. I don't use the same word, but Zazen is when you're working in the garden or in the kitchen or, or monastic things for them, right? Or for us as lay people, Whatever you're doing, you're at work, right? All of the, your zazen can be carried into all of that, mm -hmm. even though zazen means sitting zen. <laughs> so it's kind of funny that we even translate the word zen as meditation. It, mm -hmm. It's an English word, right? It's, it's its own thing. And that's that's cool. And I've actually not thought of that. That yeah, zazen or zen is just kind of synonymous with uh you know meditation but really it's not necessarily accurate and i haven't really thought of that it's not the best english word because meditation is yeah. almost thinking right <laughs> you're right. thinking about something no says we're thinking about not thinking interesting he loved it phrases like that it makes me wonder if the person that translated it and in our culture i mean it is kind of an odd idea what do you mean just being i think yeah. that that's and just so there, there just there isn't really a word or there wasn't a word and yeah, I like that. I like what you what you said there. It's not my, I mean, it's my English, but it's... <laughs> and this is kind of wrapping up a little bit of kind of getting you, getting to know you a bit. What's something that your teacher said that has stuck with you through the years? Mm. I mean, I'm sure there's a lot, but maybe there's a phrase that you seem to come back to. Actually, I can't think of one single phrase. I have an interesting story. Okay, that'll work. So 
I was in charge, of course, of different things in the in the temple. But one of my jobs is what we call, you know, in charge of the temple, uh, was to clean the altar. And so mm -hmm. when I first started to do it, they were on, they were all went on pilgrimage and left me on, in charge. And so <laughs> I wasn't even sure if I was allowed to move anything, right? Oh. <laughs> and I didn't want to move anything because it, then it all had to go back. But I had to clean it. So I was trying to clean around everything. Mm -hmm. And then when they came back, I kind of asked, you know, the head monk at the time, it's like, am I allowed to move things? Because I had trouble cleaning. So I <laughs> says, says, yeah, you have to, you know, at least, at least sometimes you have to clean it all off and then put it all back together again. But there's lots of little pieces and things all over. And it's like, I don't know where everything goes, right? So I didn't have a cell phone back then, so I couldn't take a picture. But, <laughs> but I, I just tried to remember where everything was and I put it all back together. And then the next time they went on pilgrimage, they went once a year. And I was in charge of everything. So I took it all apart. I put it all back together again. And he came back. The habit came back. And looked at that. It was after everything was done and everybody was gone. And I was cleaning up. And he said, Joseph, Joseph, come here, come here. Sit here, sit here. Right where he sits, looking at the altar, right? And he's looking mm -hmm. at and said, Joseph, is that straight? Is that straight? I don't think that's straight, Joseph. Something was crooked, right? I couldn't even hardly see it. <laughs> yeah. where, you can see where he was sitting right in the middle of it. He could see if anything was not perfectly aligned. Uh, and so I had to, to do it. And this happened to me a couple of times. And then after I became Anju of my own temple, he treated me differently. Hmm. So when I was at the temple one day, same beginning ceremony, Joseph, Joseph, come sit here. Come sit here. And I sat down and I knew the thing, something's not straight, right? And he says, something's not straight. Look, something's not straight. And I'm looking at, ah, uh, he says, well, you know, everything's handmade. So maybe I didn't even really straighten it right the first time. So don't worry about it too much. But it is part of the practice, right? You have to look at everything carefully. Look at everything. Carefully. Yeah. So his whole attitude towards me had changed a little bit. Because suddenly I'm an Anju, hmm. not just one of the trained monks, right? I'm already a priest. So it's, uh, <laughs> it's the relationship change. And with my root teacher, I had a teacher before my Zen teacher. I mentioned the Chudo Japanese art, great teacher. Chinko. Mm -hmm. It was very, very similar. As I progressed up with our, as our relationship evolved, I went from the young squire to do whatever, to mm -hmm. more like a, a brother. Hmm. Hey, how you doing today? <laughs> I'm fine. How yeah. are you? <laughs> no real instruction. Mm -hmm. And that sounds like you were kind of, you. Were, I th think from what you said earlier, you said that that was you really relied on that kind of like, what do you want me to do, teacher, kind of thing. I'm still and, that way. It's, it's horrible. They, yeah. they keep trying to toss me on my own feet. My root teacher did it. That's why I found my Zen teacher, right? And now my Zen teacher has done it. So I went looking for more. So I found mm -hmm. a couple of guys here in Sotoshu. Uh, we're, most, we're, we're not Sotoshu strictly, but our mm -hmm. ceremonies and our way of, of doing things and our, our speech is a lot like Sotoshu. Our, our lineage is Sotoshu. And, and that's it's good that you're talking about the structure of traditional practice like that. I remember being a bit surprised when I went to Dharma Rain, the Soto Zen temple. And I was like, man, this, this reminds me a lot of Catholicism, how there's bowing at very specific times. There's, it's very structured. And I think that some people may be visiting traditional Zen temples, maybe turned off by that. But I encourage people, anybody that's listening out there to, to really give it a try because the teachers I worked with explained it in the way that they said that it creates a container for people's experience. I found that to be true. You know, when you're practicing your zazen, you're having these, you know, potentially myriad of experiences through your practice. It's nice to have that structure there to guide you along. Right. Have you found that to be true or? Yes. And also what I didn't realize, at one point I thought about making, a, in fact, I, I do have a space. I have a space with no icons. Mm-hmm. Right? There's a little couch over in the next room that people who aren't comfortable sitting with the rituals and sitting with the, all the stuff can sit there. Mm -hmm. Because there's people that need that, so I, I wanted to provide it. But about that same time, I was talking to some teachers who showed me the principles that are embedded in all the movements. Mm. And I don't think we always recognize that. Uh, mm -hmm. One story is that I was in Hawaii at a, a Shingon temple. Like me, they're not really Shingon, but they're, I'm not really Sotoshu, but they're like Shingon. And they knew I studied with my root teacher, who's a Shingon priest. 
And so they let me come in the back. And so I was in the back helping out, cleaning up. I'm a good cleaner. I can't <laughs> like things. So I say I'm a good sweeper. People always see me with a broom. It's like, why does he have a broom? Like, but it's what I know how to do. Right? <laughs> I'm really not very good at much of anything else, but I can sweep. And so mm-hmm. uh, I'm there and I'm sweeping up and I'm cleaning up and I'm watching. I'm, I've never really seen this since a bone, a bone ceremony is coming up at this temple in, in Hawaii. And the, the, they're laying out the altar. And so I'm looking over his shoulder. This is how you do it. You steal it through the corner of your eye. So I'm looking over his shoulder to see how it's laid out. And he looked, oh, this might be different than your teacher taught you. And I just said, I'm just looking carefully because I haven't seen it carefully. Before. Mm. And he says, oh, he says, if I laid this out the way I do in Japan, the Japanese people would understand the principles. Mm-hmm. But if I do that here, the Hawaiian people won't understand. So I have to lay it out in a way that they can, if they look, they can see the principles. And once he said that, I was able to look a little more closely. So he's really teaching me, right? A little more closely and see the differences. I never really noticed the, the one my teacher laid out. But uh, suddenly, I could see both of them. And I could see the differences and why. And the principles popped out at me. And that's powerful that you're able to do that as a teacher. It shows that you're, uh, you're teaching from a good place when you say, you know what, I don't know. <laughs> that's, that's refreshing. My top guy follows me. You know, I just gave him transmission, and he just follows me. And every once in a while, I'm wrong, right? And mm-hmm. he says, and so it comes up that um, he and I were doing something, and I was wrong. And I'm like, oh, um, I didn't recognize that. And he says, I thought maybe it was different than that. And I was like, why didn't you say something? He says, oh, you're the teacher. <laughs> He's a Japanese guy, right? So he's like, whatever you say goes, that's the new truth. And I'm like, no, don't do that with me. <laughs> now, I am very, very careful to say, this is the teaching, and this is what I think. Mm-hmm. I never say my opinion as the teaching. Because the teaching came from the words of my teachers, and I'm passing it down orally just the way they passed it down to me. That's right. And it's, it's one of the cool things about Buddhism is seeing that direct lineage from the Buddha. You don't see that. I, I mean, I'm not familiar. I'm not a scholar on religions, but I just I don't see that very often. Or ever really, where you see that direct lineage, and you know the Buddha taught this person, and that person taught this person, and down the line. Right, and I don't know if this is historically correct either. Right, that it's sometimes through history, but the principle embedded in it is still there. Mm-hmm. I so I want to move into some some questions that may serve listeners a bit, based off of you know, interacting with people that are listening to the podcast or connecting with people. We have people that are new to meditation that are, or Zazen, that are looking into it, trying to understand it. So what advice would you give to someone that's just starting out as a Zazen, Zen practitioner? Don't expect too much. Don't be too hard on yourself. Just sit. People always expect something to happen or suddenly their cares are going to drop away or suddenly, and it could, but <laughs> we mm-hmm. sit to sit. It's a process all in it and of itself. I love that. And that's, you know, surprising even after sitting for the time I have, I still come to the practice with expectations at times. And that's that's a good good reminder. And here I say I'm a natural sitter and I just sit. But sometimes things arise. I had one the other day. Uh, to me, it was a horrible sit, right? But I still sat. And that, that's fine. I still sat. It was 7 a.m. So I sat. It's the one nice thing about having the structure again, right? Mm-hmm. Do you think that sometimes those, do, for me, have been some of the most beneficial? Do you find that in your own practice when it feels like, you know, it's not like that clear samadhi kind of feeling. It's like a very, you know, maybe disorienting at times. Do you find that those can be beneficial? Yes. Again, we don't do it for benefits, but... Right. Uh, yes. And, and also, on the other side of things, we, we only... We like the iconoclasts who say things like, I eat when I'm hungry and I sleep when I mm-hmm. sleep. Right? And it's true, especially if you're all by yourself and you're just, your body's tired, go to bed, right? But in monastic life, of course, it's the total opposite. They tell you when and where to do and how to do mm-hmm. everything. And one of the things that does, of course, is your ego is completely out of it. Yeah. And it's one of the reasons even today that I do exactly what my teachers told me to do, at least in principle. Mm-hmm. I allow it to evolve because that's the principle they gave me. But I just follow the instructions as they were handed down. That's yeah. I, I don't decide for myself. I don't want even changing the, the making a place for people to sit. 
Um, I don't want to be the person who made that decision. That's my own ego involved in deciding, oh, I like this and I don't like the cherry picking this and cherry picking that. But I do like, and my teachers gave me this leeway, luckily, that things should fit the exact time place. We're living mm -hmm. reality as it is now. Mm -hmm. So some of the reason we're online, like in ordained, not face to face, even the teaching says specifically, you can't do that. Right? Mm. Because we're in a time and place when maybe it's necessary. Mm -hmm. So what the teaching tells us is we, we are supposed to resist the change, but ever so lightly, so that when evolution changes it for us, then we accept that and embrace that. And that's why Zen particularly has changed over time, everywhere it's been and everywhere it's gone. Mm -hmm. The principles never change. We, we live a life like Shakyamuni Buddha did. He got up in the morning, I don't know if I can say this on your podcast, but he defecated, he cleaned himself, everything that human beings do. He went and he presented himself to the village, to the local people, teaching the Dharma by his presence and offering them the merit of being able to give them sustenance. He ate his meal, he washed his feet, he washed his hands, sorry, and then he sat. Mm -hmm. That's it. That's the teaching. And then he sat. Mm -hmm. But it always tells us there's certain people there. It tells us who they are even. Mm -hmm. And how many. Because his teaching may change according to that, according to that context. Sometimes his teaching mm -hmm. is one thing, sometimes the teaching is almost the opposite. Uh, because it depends on the context. Who's there? So most sutra always begin with who's there. Mm. How many are there? Who's he talking mm. to? And somebody will inevitably ask a question. Mm -hmm. And he answers their question. And what he answers to them is not necessarily what they wanted to hear. What he answers to them is what they need to hear. Because mm. the teaching also says our every thought, word, and deed must awaken all who hear. So he's got, sometimes it's a multitude, 84,000 people there, right? And, and he has to think, say, and do what they need. Because some of the sutra even give us that. There's 84,000 people there. Somebody asked a question. Shakyamuni Sutsu spoke, and 84,000 people woke up. And this, this brings up a little bit of an interesting question that's just something I'm curious about. So knowing, you know, what you said about... Um, using your words and your, your, the way you are, your being to awaken those around you. I'm curious if there's how you walk that line between being of benefit or being a thorn in people's sides in a sense where you're a know-it-all. Um, and yeah, and I don't know if that's easily answerable. I'm sure it's just kind of changes with the situation, right? Like you talked about your teacher moving, moving in the way. He wasn't trying anyways. I'm way too soft. Okay. I, I, I'm not a good teacher because <laughs> I answer questions and I will answer questions exactly the way it needs to be answered. Mm. But if somebody answers their own question to me mm -hmm. or they make a statement to me, I'm most likely going to agree. Mm. Because to them at that moment, that's their truth. They didn't ask me my teachings. They didn't ask me my opinion. They simply stated to me what they thought. And I think they want me to even contradict them sometimes, to tell them where they're wrong or something. And I may or may not agree. But to me, they didn't ask. They told me. Mm. And I say usually something like, that's a very interesting way of looking. Mm -hmm. That's a very okay. nice That's a very nice answer. So I couldn't be a co-op teacher, right? Right. <laughs> I couldn't whack them and say, you don't know what you're talking about. Get out of the room. <laughs> you'd be, you'd be Oprah. You'd be, you're right. And you're right. And you're right. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm, I have what we call grandmother Zen. <laughs> I like it though. I, you know, you think that's true? Sounds feasible. It's possible. Who am I to say, right? Yeah. Well, I'm supposed to be the Zen master, I guess, but I'm, it's true for them as far as I'm concerned. So I'm a little too soft and I, I get in trouble with this all the time. And, and some students really like it. Mm -hmm. uh, they like not being told what to do, right? And I, I don't tell people what to do. I do exactly what my teachers told me to do. Mm -hmm. and that's probably why they like me and why they created me to this whatever position I'm in, because I did exactly what they told me to do. 
when I was a kid, I worked in my grandfather's metal shop. And my brother did too. He fired my brother, but he didn't fire me. My brother was smarter than me, knew more than my grandfather knew. He was really good, really, but he kept trying to tell my grandfather how to do things better. Mm -hmm. But I did. I did whatever my grandfather told me. to. And my grandfather one time said, he came to me, he says, why are you doing that? Why are you doing that? I said, this is what you told me to do. He told me to do this, 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 and this. That's what I'm doing. He's like, oh, mm -hmm. well, I told you wrong. I want you to do it. <laughs> right? But my brother would have said, I fixed it. <laughs> and I like that about Zen Buddhism is that there's room for that. You know, you have the the brick and the, the what is it, fire and brimstone teachers where they'll come at you with a, a switch. Yeah. And some people really need that. They shouldn't be with me. <laughs> and, you know, potentially people that grew up in households that were more strict and everything was laid out and they were told what to do and they grew up with that. Potentially your way of teaching, it can be very healing and powerful for that person that grew up in that environment. And like you said, it's not, uh, my, my wife has a saying she always loved to say, and she says, it's not about being right. It's about being effective. Yes. Oh, I should ordain her. That's good. <laughs> and I think the, this kind of ties in wrapping up this, this section of what we were talking about as far as like when to help someone or if it's our place to help someone. And sometimes, you know, you could be right. Someone could say something and you could correct them and you'd be right, but is it effective? And like you said, are they actually asking for guidance? Are they open to that guidance? And will it have any benefit to them right. to say that in that moment? Every thought, word, and deed must awaken all who hear. And that yeah. must be our viewpoint every time mm. we teach. Will this awaken everyone who hears? So the teaching is quite clear. It tells us if we're not sure, keep your mouth shut. Mm. Now, there are instances where for safety or somebody's particular place in life, we have to speak even if we're not absolutely sure. But we should say we're not absolutely sure. Mm. But the teaching says if you're not sure, keep your mouth shut. Mm. So I it, love that. It's it's a leaning. Which way there's always a way to lean. This is the exact spot, but there's always a way to lean. And and the teaching says our, our lean is to be quiet. So just sit quietly. If we're not sure don't move yet. I'm not sure don't speak yet. Uh, but when we're sure and something needs to be done, we have to do it, whatever it is. Mm. It's, it's really quite clear. It's powerful. It's also quite clear that I'm teaching. You only teach people who have asked sincerely three times. Mm -hmm. Now, they can ask through their presence, from ask for you to be their teacher. There's a different, many different ways to ask. They don't have to sit there and verbally say, mm -hmm. please teach me this, please teach me this, please teach me this. But if they haven't sincerely asked you three times, lean towards keeping your mouth shut. Mm. So teaching people who haven't asked to be taught is futile. Mm -hmm. They have to ask. Yeah. And this is why in our particular branch, we don't even have Dharma talks. I don't teach. I have to be asked. My students complain about it. You should have told me I was doing that wrong. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't ask. I was playing the bells one time, and I was having a hard time keeping the bell sound consistent. And I've been playing for 15 years. <laughs> nah, 10 years. I've been probably playing the bells for him for 10 years. And, and then I asked one time, I'm having a little, you, when you play the bell, it's very consistent, but I'm having a little trouble keeping it consistent. He says, oh, finally you asked. <laughs> so for, for all those years, I've been playing it wrong. <laughs> and then he came up and he showed me, right? And, oh, wow. And that's our tradition. You keep doing it until you, you figure it out. In fact, my root teacher would say, he, he, he would travel around the world doing these lectures and I would travel with him. So he's doing a lecture one time and he always ended with this, he, didn't, he often ended with, so questions are very rude, but does anybody have any? <laughs> right, because it's, you're not supposed to ask these questions, but in fact, we can only ask, answer you if you ask a question. So it's a little bit of a dichotomy. Mm -hmm. If you can only talk to me if I ask a question, but it's rude to ask a question, this is going to be a very quiet place. Mm -hmm. And he's like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> he's like, that's what I want. <laughs> <laughs> so, we, so we sit quietly. But inevitably, somebody has a, a burning question. Or they just like to ask questions and they, they don't mind being rude. But <laughs> and they'll ask a question. 
But this is what we really want. We don't mean you can't have to ask a question. What we mean is, is you should have sat with that question quietly first. And after sitting quietly with that question, you have just come to an impasse. Then you should ask. It becomes a burning question. Your doubt has been raised. You, you can, you, sh you not only can you, but you should now bring that question to me. Mm -hmm. And then we can answer your question. I like that concept. You're talking about working with your with your teacher directly. And we were talking about this a little bit earlier about people not really having access to a sangha, a place to practice. What advice would you give to someone that is maybe stumbled across this podcast, they're listening to this, they say this is interesting, but they don't have access to a physical place to meditate or a sangha community? What I guess where would you say someone maybe would start with that journey? Yeah, so it is really good to have a teacher. People can do this without a teacher. I mean, anybody can sit. Anybody, just sit, right? Especially mm -hmm. Zazen, just sit. But guidance is sometimes needed. Mm -hmm. uh, things come up. Things are difficult. Uh, at least perform. If you don't have a teacher and you, and you can't find a teacher, then at least make a structure, you know, find a place. If you can, a particular time. If you can, a particular place, right? A sacred spot where you can just sit. That's all that space is for, if you can. If you if you have, I have it just before I go to bed every night at 10 p.m. Great. That's your time. Mm. I don't even care how long. Five minutes, 10 minutes, two minutes, one minute, one breath. I don't care. But that's your time. Mm. Whether it's one heartbeat or a thousand, that's your time. Just having a set time every, every day that you can reliably. Uh... If it's at all possible. If you can, whenever you got the time. Whenever you got the place, you're sitting on the bus, you're sitting on the train. Yeah. My, my current mentor is a walker. He likes to walk. He walks all day long. He doesn't really do sitting meditation. I was like, you don't do sitting meditation. That's un unbelievable. We're, we do Zazen. I do Zazen every day. He's like, well, I can do that on the bus. I can do that on the train. I can do that on the train. So <laughs> he said, that's what I do Zazen. Yeah. But find a place where you, that's all you're doing. Yeah. Any time of the day. Right. And then that starts to infuse itself in your daily life. So daily life is zazen, and zazen is meditation. You're sitting practice, right? Mm -hmm. But they're not they're not separable. They're not two things, right? So people can live like that, but that doesn't mean they can throw the zazen out the window. Oh well, I'm just doing zen every moment of every day, so I don't need zazen. Dogen warns us against that. He has a teaching that says that that you don't need zazen; you can just do your work. But he's talking to people who don't want to work. Mm. <laughs> they just, or if you say we, Zazen is the only one and only way, then why are we out working in the fields? Why do we have to work in the kitchen? Right? And he says, you don't understand. Working in the kitchen, working in the fields, that is your Zazen. Mm -hmm. So then today we say, then why do I need Zazen? But he already warns us against that. That's not what he means. I didn't know that. I, I, I think I've heard that and I didn't understand the context. That's, that's important. This, this context is so important in all these teachings and all these stories. I see people often talking about the dogma, about the teachings themselves, but they take them out of context. Mm -hmm. But my teachers were really, really good about giving me the context and the principles and the stories, mm -hmm. sutras, they would have little twists and turns. Now that I'm reading the sutras, we're like, that word's not in there. <laughs> <laughs> my teacher said this, but that word's not in there. But the principle behind the story is they're very strong. Mm -hmm. And so by, I'm really getting these principles very, very well. Um, mm -hmm. One day I'll actually be a true Zen teacher. I think. <laughs> I'm not sure. Give me 20 years one day when we all grow up. <laughs> when I grow up. <laughs> yeah. Right now I just do what I'm told. It's a really wonderful way to live. So next question I have pertains a little bit to the environment that we're in politically, socially. I've been experiencing intention of emotions during this time. I think other people have as well. So I wanted to ask, other than, you know, Zazen or, or sitting, sitting meditation, seated meditation, what, what advice would you give to someone that's experiencing, you know, in, these intense emotions, you know, maybe chronic anxiety, depression, things like that? How does someone approach these things as a Zen practitioner? So this really depends on that person. I mean, if it's, if it's the true, um, difficulty in living daily life, if it's really affecting daily life to the degree that they can't live daily life, then probably Zazen is not enough. They probably do need at least a 
some therapist of some kind to, to discuss these things that somebody who's trained in that language, because language is so important, it's a different language. Uh, and then of course, if it's really uh, extreme, they may need medication or whatever. But uh, I, my degree is in psychology and I worked as a rap group therapist in, uh, in the hospital. Oh, well. Wow. But I don't have a license. I was under a psychiatrist who told me what to do. <clears throat> Mostly I made people take the medications. But my job was a, like a rap group facility. Mm -hmm. And so I would just sit in there and, and let them talk. Right? Mm -hmm. So that's fine. This was in a locker. So yeah. um, it was very interesting to me to see that kind of interaction. But I think at some point that kind of interaction is, is needed mm -hmm. rather than just sitting it with yourself, by yourself. Uh, now, yeah. there are some good Zen teachers out today that are trained psychologists. Right, right. And they can probably deal with this really good job. I, mean, I was never licensed, so I'm not going to mm -hmm. bring that to. But the people who are licensed, in fact, there's whole Buddhist degrees now. Some of my people here, they come and sit with me. Uh, did sit with me. Their training is like uh, counselors. Mm hmm other kinds of therapists. And, and oh, it's, I think it's transpersonal psychology, I think. There's there's all different ones. That's right. Yeah. And so the, there's they're actually getting licensed to be even Buddhist chaplains. Right? Oh, wow. And, and things like that. Uh, and so that's really, really interesting to me, where they're, they're combining the two. And there's people who have separated from their, their Buddhist lineages to include more psychology. Because mm. Buddhism is kind of related, but it's not. Same. Right. And I think that's something that, you know, the more and more I practice and learn and talk with the other practitioners, that's one thing that was one of my biggest misconceptions coming into it was, you know, I was trying, I was using, again, Zazen or mindfulness as a uh, tool to get something, to get somewhere. And my thing was dealing with anxiety that I was experiencing. Yeah, I just, I think, and, and I'm open, and that's what I, I want to open, as you said, to you know, if you do have a, a correction on this view, so I'm opening that to you, uh, so you don't have to just go with what I'm saying. <laughs> but, um, You're asking a question. I, Very good. <laughs> you listen. Yeah, so I'm asking the question, oh, in a sense, my belief right now is, or my viewpoint is that, yeah, more and more Zazen is not this vehicle to get somewhere, but it's it's just to be here. And like like we were talking about earlier, sitting is the, it is the end goal. And it's not a tool to to change something. Yes, this doesn't mean things won't change. Right. It just means that if you once you tag that onto it, it's no longer zazen. It becomes a different kind of meditation. And we have lots of them. I mentioned there's thousands of meditations. Mm -hmm. And yes, you can use them to bring things into your life, and you can use them to better yourself. I mean, mindfulness has done that way a lot today. Mm -hmm. It's a little separate from the original teachings, but their mindfulness teachings are used in business today, right? And and they work, and you can use them for anxiety, and you can use them, and they have an effect. Lots of therapists mm -hmm. use them. Mm -hmm. um, I think it, it's very effective. But it, when when you when you bring it back to the term of zazen, zen not, zen sect teaches it. That's not why we do it. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean it doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. Once you attach that thinking to it, it's no longer Zazen. But it can still be effective. It just, you can't call it Zazen. Well, you could call it Zazen. But I wouldn't. Right. I would no longer call it Zazen, but I would certainly say it's a type of meditation. Breathing meditation. We use breathing meditation in Zen temples all the time. It's not Zazen. But mm -hmm. it's very effective in bringing the mind back. And you may have, in a way, painted an, a outline of what zazen is but for myself and, and listeners i guess what is zazen <laughs> <laughs> zazen is sitting zen up so zen is being absorbed into reality kind of like a sponge right if you think of a sponge in water and you put mm -hmm. the sponge in a, in, a, in a little plate of water it will soak up that water mm -hmm. so now do you have what is that is that a sponge or is that water mm. it, it's not it's not two things anymore, but it is two things. Mm. They're not separate. They're, they're absorbed into each other. So we're like that with reality. That's the way Zen Zuma, that, this is the way we live Zen. We live Zen by living right now, right here. 
That's beautiful. You now, also learn is right here, right now. It's everywhere, at every time. But it's uh, fun too. But right here, right now. Thank you for that teaching. That definitely connected with me, and I appreciate that. That was beautiful. So this is tied in a little bit to what we were talking about earlier about Zen resisting change to a degree, but then adapting in a, a unique Zen-like way. <laughs> <laughs> what do you see? And this is an interesting question, I think, for you in particular, because you talked about following tradition, following what the teacher taught you, and just doing that to the T. What do you see being the future of Buddhism? What will, you know, what will Sangha look like in the digital revolution? And I mean, if you could just, you know, imagine or paint a picture of where you see things going in, you know, 50 or 100 years, what does that look like? That's a fabulous question, because it's exactly the same question I have. Yeah. So on Facebook and Insight Timer and all these places, I, I've started these groups called uh, American Zen, right? Mm -hmm. But not because I know, but because I can't figure it out. Mm. Especially once we get to the West, particularly America, where we're a little more as a cultural in individualistic, right? It's the way we, mm -hmm. we come at things. Where, like in Japan, they're more a little more societal, right? mm -hmm. not in, not individually, but as a whole, as a mm -hmm. culture, they tend to be more not cohesive. But they, the group is more important than the individual. They're willing to sacrifice an individual for the group. Right. But in, in the West, and particularly in America, we're not always willing, as a culture, willing to do that. Mm -hmm. Individually, there's plenty of people that are, but. As a culture, it just doesn't tend, tend to be our tendency. Mm -hmm. And so what is that? What that does is it opens up a whole host of individual possibilities from people who really toe the line and do it exactly like Japan. Mm -hmm. As little adaption as human possible to people who throw the books out and become an iconoclast kind of, of their own and have, they might not even call it Zen or anything anymore. It's just them. Mm -hmm. Right, so I'm big on words and word choice. So I have a little trouble sometimes uh, with my own attachment to that. Mm -hmm. This is this is Zen. And I'm like, it's not what I was not. <laughs> no, it's, it's actually throwing the principles on their head. But okay, right? so I have a little trouble with people calling that Zen. Mm -hmm. um, but it happens. Yeah. Well, it's been a good conversation. I did want to open up, you know, the floor and ask. Is there anything, you know, you'd like to offer to listeners, to people that are um, engaging with this, that are interested in Buddhism, they may be longtime practitioners or new, is there anything you'd like to kind of say or close with? I would. I would like to include one more caveat to our conversation on the practice for them. So I mentioned that find the time and place and, and have a sitting practice. This is the most important thing. But I also mentioned that they need a teacher. You mentioned that they might not have a teacher nearby to go to. Mm -hmm. But Jundo Koen, a tree leaf online, mm -hmm. is a wonderful big online sangha from all over the world. He's in Japan. He has a wonderful teacher. So they can join tree leaf. Mm -hmm. they, they can join my Kanzianji, but we're pretty small. We don't have the, the resources that he's implied online. He's got, he's got everything. You go to his website and it lays out all kinds of talks. His website's fabulous. We don't even have a website, <laughs> right? <laughs> they can join us on Zoom if they want. They can ask me a question if they want, if they happen to catch to what I've talked to today. But if they're really looking for an online song, like this tree leaf, uh, mm. poem, it's just a fabulous opportunity for them. And that's an opportunity for everybody all over the world. Tree leaf. Okay, I didn't know about that. And I'm going to check that out too. It's been a pleasure talking with you. And I hope that this is uh, the beginning of a new friendship. Hopefully I can reach out to you as Imperfect Buddhist is going along and I can interview you again, see where you're at in the journey over there. Yeah, I might be able to do a follow-up. I got more stories. I got lots of them. 